Greetings quilters. When I first saw a Bargello quilt design, I was so amazed, but I didn't think that I could make one. It's taken me years to get up the nerve to try. Thanks to those who have shared their knowledge on YouTube, we finally made three Bargello quilts. We want to share the things that we have gleaned from others. These quilts are basically the same. The main difference is the color of the material and the arrangement of the columns. These quilts are about 85 by 100 inches. Let me take you on a quick review of how a simple Bargello quilt is made. First thing is to cut the material into strips and arrange the colors the way that we want them in the quilt. Second, we sew the strips together. Third, we cut the strips into the widths needed to give the illusion of movement. Fourth, we arrange the colors into the up or down pattern that we want. Fifth, we sew the strips together. This is a simple Bargello pattern. The left side is opposite of the right side and the top half is opposite of the bottom half. They are mirror images of each other. You may want to check these YouTube presentations out. Bargello Quilts by Becky Botello. Becky has put together many Bargello quilt designs and it's inspirational to see what she's done. Jordan Fabrics Bargello Quilt Donna's presentation is very good. The Quilting Marine, let's make a Bargello quilt in five parts. I just loved his presentation, especially where he talks about it's just fabric and it's just thread. Just a comment on making the project using jelly rolls. It will greatly simplify color selection and prep time is select a pattern or make your own pattern. You can make your own pattern with graph paper. You can color one row to see the up and down movement of the design. I have used a spreadsheet and adjusted the column widths and the row heights to represent the project dimensions. The motion or flow of the design is dependent on the widths of the columns. Wider columns produce less motion but gentler curves. Narrow columns produce quicker motion and sharper curves. I used a spreadsheet to calculate the length of material needed for each row. To figure out material needed for each row, add the width of each column, then count the number of columns and add a half an inch seam allowance for each column. Add these two numbers and this gives the length of the material needed for each roll. We need to make four panels to complete the quilt. Two panels will have 22 columns and the other two panels will have 23 columns. This project needs a total of 201 inches of material for each roll. We know that we can get about 41 inches from the width of yardage. So we will need five pieces of yardage at 41 inches wide to get the 201 inches needed for each color. Using the design, we determine the sequence of colors and the number of colors needed. Each row will use just under half a yard. And for colors with duplicate rows, we will need about 7 eighths of a yard. We know how much fabric to buy now for each color. Shopping for fabric is just fun, although a little frustrating at times. Some of the fabrics had dirt on them and needed to be washed. Other than that, we do not think that washing is needed. Unfortunately, ironing is. These are the fabrics we chose for our granddaughter's quilts. Pink and purple for one quilt and pink and teal for the other quilt. We use our plan to calculate how many two and a half inch strips of each color we need to cut. 
we make tags so that we will know the order of each color and how many of each color to cut. Many of the colors are used in multiple rows. We prefer to cut one fabric at a time to ensure the width of the strips are as accurate as possible. But we also have cut multiple layers. It just depends. We clip the cut tag with the strips to keep the information and strips together. We refer to our plan and arrange the strips in the order to be sewn. We know that not all strips will be the same length, so we match the usable part of the strip as we sew. If you like to pull on the fabric to keep it straight, you may find that you have crooked strips. But if you will let the machine pull the fabric, and all you do is guide it through the machine, you should not have any problems with curves in your strips. We use the first panel sewn as a template to sew the rest of the panels from. We have two tables set up, one with the template and the other with the strips to be sewn. You can see the difference in the lengths of the different fabrics. We now have five strip panels sewn together and they are all exactly the same. So we no now have the 201 inches of fabric needed to proceed to the next step. We need to sew each panel into a continuous loop. We do this by matching one end of the panel to the other end. We sew these together face to face so that we have a continuous loop needed for the next step. We're now ready to press the seams so that they will nest correctly. This is done by ironing every other strip open. It is important to iron all of the strip panels starting with a specific color so that all panels are ironed exactly the same way. We check to see if we have the material we plan to have. If this measurement was less than 41 inches, we could make a quick adjustment to the plan by adjusting the width of some strips to make everything come out okay. We have listed the widths and number of pieces needed, so we're ready to start cutting. We use a cut list to assure that we are cutting the correct number of pieces and sizes needed. We also mark the checklist as we go. When cutting the strips, the thread between the rows gets cut and the rows, rows can pull apart very easily. We recommend using a normal stitch length and use care when handling. When all of the strips are cut to the proper width, it's time to arrange them in the planned order. Then arrange the column colors with the desired pattern. It is still not too late to make changes to the pattern. Now it's time to pick out the seam of the top row to keep the pattern that we want. Gently tugging the edges of the seam will open the seam up. Then finish the job with the seam ripper. Make sure that you keep these columns in the proper order and we're almost ready to start sewing again. We have ironed the seams in the correct direction and don't want them to be sewn in the wrong direction. To prevent this, we use a piece of template plastic as a slider to keep the seams from flipping the wrong direction as they move under the pressure foot. We have cut a hole for the feed dogs in the plastic. Use a piece of painter's tape to hold the template plastic in place. To change the bobbin, bobbin, simply slide the template plastic out from under the pressure foot. When sewing the strips together, you can easily align the seams opposite to each other. When you feel the seams nest together, you're ready to sew. Iron all of the seams in the same direction. Notice how the seams are offset from each other. When the seams are aligned and lying flat, it makes free motion quilting easier. We have two panels with 22 columns. Pla place them diagonally from each other. Place the other two panels with 23 columns, each diagonally from each other. You can see that we have a duplicate roll, row in between the top half of the quilt and the bottom half of the quilt. 
Use your seam ripper and carefully rip the extra roll out all the way across the quilt. Sew or repair the seams between the blocks and iron the ends flat. The four panels are now ready to be sewn together. We sew the two top pieces together and then the two bottom pieces together and then sew the top half to the bottom half. Now we are ready to make the border. For this quilt, a four inch border will be fine. So we are cutting four and a half inch strips and sewing them together to make the border. We like to lay the border around the edges of the quilt to see if we have enough border material to fit the quilt. Sew the border and the quilt top face to face. Do the left and right sides of the quilt first. Trim the excess material and then sew the border to the top and bottom edges. This is the last opportunity to make sure that the seams are iron flat. We couldn't find the desired color in 108 inches for the purple quilt. So we had to make the back of the quilt out of two pieces sewn together. It is best at this stage to iron out the fold mark left in the center of the, from the bold of material. We thumbtack the back face down on the quilting frame. At this point we only thumbtack the four corners and the center of each side. Lay the batting over the quilt backing on the frame to make sure your batting lays flat and hangs over the edge of the backing. We lay the quilt top on the batting and thumbtack the corners of the top then we thumbtack the centers of the sides. As we thumbtack, we make sure that the back, batting, and top are all gently pulled evenly. We thumbtack about every eight inches. We're ready to safety pin the quilt top, batting, and back together. We safety pin the quilt about every six or eight inches. We're going to do free motion quilting. So it's time to remove the plastic template from the sewing machine. This is a meander template that we will be using with the associated quarter inch ruler foot. And most importantly, the Teflon slider mat. The Teflon mat is necessary for this process. Our machine has an extension table that needs to be secured to the sewing machine with painter's tape. We also tape the Teflon mat across the front to hold it in place so that we can pull it out from under the pressure foot to change the bottom bobbin. We use a pen to mark the pattern of the template on a piece of paper. The pattern repeats about every five inches. We have marked the center of the template with a felt tip pen. Free motion quilting is best done with coated or textured gloves that will grip the fabric. This will greatly reduce hand strain. The quilt is about 84 inches wide and the template covers 5 inches. So we will need 17 repeats of this pattern to complete, completely cover the quilt. We start in the center of the quilt and each column will be 5 inches to either side of this center column. Adjust the free motion quilting foot to the correct height. If it's too high, the thread will shred and break. If it's too low, you'll get stuck where the seams are too high. You may have to hop the foot over some of the high seams. Be sure to pull the bottom thread to the top or it will make a rat's nest on the bottom of the quilt. If the quilt hangs over the edge of the sewing table, it may hang up on the, on the corner of the table or even the edge and you will not be able to move the quilt freely, which will cause sewing problems. See Paula Reed's fluff and stuff method on YouTube. This process will keep enough material loose so that you can move the quilt under the sewing foot. We use the edge of the template and align it with the nearest seam to keep the template aligned all the way down the quilt. 
Here's an example of getting stopped at the seam intersection and how to hop over the seam. Your choice of thread will make your stitching either disappear or stand out. If your material has different values, you will have to decide where the thread will show and where it will not show. The quilting is finished and we are ready to trim the quilt to the final size. We lay the quilt on the floor and put the cutting mat under it. We use the rotary cutting tool to trim the quilt to the size. It works just fine. Cutting corners is easy with the help of a bowl or plate. The quilt is cut to the final size and shape and we are now ready to add the binding. We use two and a half inch wide binding and iron it in half. It can be stored carefully, rolled on a cardboard until it is needed. We prefer to pin the binding to the top of the quilt and sew it with the machine, but I am sure you could just align it as you sew. Corners take a lot of pins to keep the top and the bottom edges aligned. If you pin the binding to the top of the quilt, be sure to keep the fabric edges aligned and do not pull the binding. Just guide it through the machine using, using your quarter inch seam. Pull the binding to the back side. Pinning the binding takes a lot of stress off from the thumbs. Use a hem stitch to secure the binding to the back side of the quilt. We really like the look of this method of binding. This is the youngest granddaughter's quilt. It is the pink and purple quilt. This is her older sister's quilt. It is the pink and teal quilt. And this is the older brother's quilt. We built this one first just to see if we could figure it out. It was made from fabric that we had on hand. We were not sure that the colors would work well together, but we feel that this worked out very well. Of course, no handmade quilt is complete without a name tag. The name tag can be sewn on the underneath side using the same hem stitch. Thank you for watching. We hope that you have enjoyed our presentation of how to make a simple Bargello quilt.